Hello and welcome. I am Scott with Artist Network and welcome to Drawing Together. This is a pre-recorded uh, version of the series, a pre-recorded episode. We're going to be working on this peony drawing today. So if you'd like to follow along, the reference image is in the description below. I have it up in front of me on a screen that I'll be working from. Uh, so feel free to follow along. Today's demonstration is in um, going to be working in charcoal. Um, and so I have this 11 by 14 paper that I've already kind of cut down to size um, and I want to walk through the materials that I've got. So we're going to be starting off with vine charcoal. I've got a couple of just small sticks of vine charcoal. I've got my compressed charcoal pencils here. These are four B's um, and you can see that I've, I've taken a razor blade and I've shaved away the core uh, or, the, or the casing of the material to expose the core. Um, I also have a couple kind of sharpened ends uh, that we're going to uh, utilize. I've got my trusty shading stumps as well. Uh, so I've got my old one. I've got a new one in case I need it. I have my two uh, erasers, my rubber eraser, and my well-used kneaded eraser. So with that, we're going to get started. And as you can see, you're joining um, at a point where I've already kind of initiated the kind of the early phases of it. So utilizing the um, the vine charcoal, what I've been doing is trying to get a feel for where I'm going to be placing the peony on the uh, on the page here. And I'm also simply just getting marks on the page. The initial gesture is all about um, getting something on to the page so then I have something that I can react to. Um, and uh, so the, what I'm going to be doing now is kind of refining that. I'm thinking about some negative drawing here. Um, if that's a, a, an unfamiliar term to you, um, there is there are kind of two forms of space that we refer to in drawing. There's positive space and negative space. So positive space is everything that is the object. Negative space is everything in the space around it. So in this case, what I'm doing here is drawing the shape of that black space behind the peony. Um, what I love about this reference photo that I found is that it has a strong contrast between light and dark. It's got this alternating pattern of dark background against light hitting the peony, transitioning into this darker shadow area against a relatively light kind of foliage uh, back there. So uh, there's, a, uh, there's a pleasing alternation between those two and, and it creates um, these distinct spaces. So we have a distinct shape of um, uh, some of th this dark area here um, and if we draw that shape, the resulting space in here will be the shape of the peony. And throughout the drawing, it will be um, it, it will be working kind of back and forth between looking at the positive space and the negative space. I think that's a helpful uh, skill to learn as an artist is to think about you know, and constantly be aware of that relationship between the positive and negative space. Uh, so with this fine charcoal, I'm just kind of keeping uh, the marks light, loose, reacting very quickly. I'm trying to think more in terms of shape. So what that means is, is that rather than kind of outlining too much or a, a huge amount, I'm uh, thinking about trying to create initial blocks of shape. Uh, and that for me, that becomes easier to um, react to when I'm trying to determine the proportions of various elements in the drawing. Now you can see that the vine charcoal just kind of wipes away very quickly. So these initial passes that I'm making are really for my own mental benefit. I'm trying to wrap my head around the, the size, the shape, the placement of each of these objects. And so the marks that I'm making I know are going to disappear. That's just the nature of the vine charcoal is that it's, that it's kind of ephemeral. And so uh, I know it's going to be disappearing, but this helps me to kind of just envision what the final drawing could be. Also, also thinking about that alternating sequence of light and dark. So as I squint my eyes, I'm seeing that there are these, these broad patterns of light and dark. And, and this, is, this will allow me to determine you know, whether I've placed it on the page properly and in a way that's pleasing or uh, you know, if things need to be moved. So my initial attempt was a little bit too high um, and now it's uh, feeling a little bit better to me. It's not just that it's, it's replicating the photo more accurately, but it feels more pleasing compositionally. Uh, so 
and take some time to really kind of map out where you want your uh, your, your your flower to be. Um, and the general philosophy that I have is that throughout your entire drawing process, you want to be thinking in such a way that you could really stop at any moment and you know what it is that you're drawing. So that in those initial strikes you're making with the charcoal um, should have some sort of information about the subject and in, in a very quick gesture um, can be very effective at suggesting the form. Um, and what with that approach, the idea in the process becomes about pulling the image out onto the paper and allowing it to emerge on the surface rather than um, drawing an outline and then filling it in, rather than it going through very specific phases. And so we're trying to think of it all kind of coming up together at once. Um, and then as we go through it, we can become more specific with the, uh, with the proportions, uh, with, uh, you know, with some of the details in there. So um, one of the things I need to be mindful of are, is what happens around the edges. I want this to feel three-dimensional. And controlling edges is an essential element of that. Uh, one of the things you learn very quickly uh, when learning to draw is that lines are an abstract idea. Lines are abstractions. They're a symbol for an edge. Uh, a contour line, the line that defines the outer edge of an object, um, is a symbol for three-dimensional form on a two-dimensional surface. And so it can be a very powerful tool, um, but when we realize that lines don't exist in nature, only edges do, then it can sometimes change the way we um, perceive in the, the forms of the object and how we render them. Uh, and so what, I would what I'm going for here is I want this to feel more realistic. You know, it's not going to be highly detailed. There's a difference between detail and realism. You know, some highly detailed drawings can be very realistic, um, but you could also have highly detailed drawings that are not realistic, you know, that, that maybe um, don't capture the light. They have a ton of detail, but maybe they don't hold together in terms of the form. You know, so, um, and then by the same token, a you can make something that's very loose and gestural, but also feels realistic. Um, it feels like it captures something about the essence of the reality of the object. Um, there's an interesting line showing up through that paper. Uh, so uh, it's going back to the idea of the edges, one of the things I'm looking at is that this is generally a spherical form. Um, what I want to be careful of is when I'm working with that negative space behind the flower, I want those, those background marks to push back and I need them then to contrast the direction of the, of the edge. So as I'm, as what you can see me doing here is I'm making this mark that defines the edge of the flower, but it's running parallel to that edge. And if I do that too much, it's gonna flatten out the drawing. So if I can, what I wanna do is try to turn my hand and run it in a different direction. So if I'm making any lines here, what I wanna do is make, make them very, very light, enough so I can visualize the path, and then I can adjust the angle of my marks in that background to run contrary to it. Uh, so when, when the whole drawing is done, hopefully we'll recognize that these marks running horizontally like this are in a different place in space. They push back and this kind of more vertical edge of the flower projects forward. And then as you saw, I overlapped those marks. So I'm going right over the edge of where that, that petal of the peony should be. And uh, and I'm not worried about that because then I can cut that back out with my eraser. Right now I'm just going to start to build up some additional charcoal back there. But what I can do now is I can continue to refine this edge by erasing up into it. And then what that does is it creates clear overlap between the marks that run one direction in the background and that more vertical edge of that petal there. Uh, and you're always contributing to the form. So even though I have an eraser, the eraser isn't just a tool for correcting mistakes. 
it is an opportunity to define and refine the form of the object. And so when I do that, I want to be thinking before I start erasing where, you know, am I in the right spot? What is the angle that I should be utilizing? What's the scale of that pedal, etc. So um, you always want to be thinking about contributing to the form. And that provides in the opportunity that every mark you make will potentially say something that's beneficial about that form. It'll help the, the viewer understand what it is. Um, and it, you know, not just the viewer, but you yourself as the artist, you'll have, you'll come to a better understanding of, uh, of the, the flower. The better you understand an object, the stronger the drawing will be. And so as I come up here around that top edge, again, I'm kind of thinking about the negative space. And I'm in my mind, I'm kind of working back and forth between thinking about the shape of that black shape and then, then the, that resulting negative space, which becomes a positive space of the flower. And so as I'm doing that, I'm looking at the, these curves and these angles, and I'm trying to put my awareness on other aspects of the drawing. So as I'm making this curve here, I'm doing a quick check-in to see where I am relative to other parts of the drawing. Where, is, where am I? related to this, uh, this petal here that I have established. As I come across and I, and I see this dip down in here, I can do a check-in to see where should that be relative to the height of this petal that I established. And this should actually come down a little bit lower than that. And so that, that is a, it's also a large part of observational drawing is being able to split your awareness um, so that we don't become hyper-focused on a single spot in the drawing, but instead we're constantly double-checking where are we uh, in the object. You know, because what happens when we, when we become fixated on a, a single spot too long, it tends to distort. You know, we are primed as humans to be uh, observing things that are in motion, we don't often, if you, if you notice and you pay attention to how we observe things, you may notice that it's very difficult for us to hold our gaze fixed on a single object for very long, where I, our eyes are constantly darting around. And then what happens is that we take, as our eye darts around and is gathering information from various spots in the field in front of you, then your brain is putting together that information and creating an understanding of that entire space. Um, and if in a drawing we become too fixed on a single spot on the subject, then what happens is our brain starts to react against that. You know, it has that natural tendency to, to want to move. Um, and, and, and so we, we want our drawing to, to, be, to develop in that in a very similar way. So here's what I, I started working on this negative space in here seeing this kind of bump that comes up and here. I'm going to continue to refine that. I don't feel like I'm, I'm making these uh, proportions very accurately, but I, part of what, you know, throughout the drawing process, you kind of have to assume that things are going to be wrong um, and then constantly be double checking. Just going to smooth this out a little bit. I'm not worried about protecting the shape of the, the flower. You can see that that edge still exists. Um, I can always pull back out some of the, the light here with an eraser. may not get to that super bright white that I need, but um, I'm not, I, I try not to be precious with the drawing. And this can be, uh, you can take the same approach whether you're working in charcoal or, or graphite. Um, it, it lends itself to charcoal a little bit more, but I'm constantly kind of laying down material and wiping it down, laying it down, wiping it down, erasing, laying it down. You're kind of, you're moving the materials around. Um, and for me, that, that tends to, to work better than finishing one spot and then moving on to the next and finishing on the, that spot and then moving on to that next one. Uh, because, um, uh, my goal is for unity. I want somebody to look at this and see the flower, not the individual petals. I want them to look at it and see the, the, the whole of it, 
And then as you get into it, you might be able to distinguish the individual petals. But the first, the first response I want to be flower, because that's the response I have when I look at the reference photo. If, it, if this was in real life, that's what I would observe in real life. And so I want to be careful. You can see that I'm not completing a whole line. I'm taking little chunks of it and then kind of feathering it out into that background. And I'm trying to utilize the side of my pencil as much as possible. It's kind of rolling in my fingers as I go uh, so that I'm not developing a, an area that's too flat on the, on the charcoal. So I'm looking at this shape in here, and I, you know, I see I need to refine it to some degree. And what I'm going to do is kind of feather this out because we start to get more light down in here. And this is what I really liked about that reference photo is that it has this really interesting alternating sequence of light and dark. some negative drawing in here to suggest this leaf that's kind of coming out and I I want to keep this background loose and gestural um, you know for you if you're following along you know you may want to add more detail in the in that background area but I don't know as if I really need it for this drawing and I kind of like the energy having a spot in the drawing where I can be a bit more expressive um, I kind of I kind of find that for me personally, if I get sucked into the detail in one area, I need a spot where I can just loosen up, move my arms around. Uh, doing some angle sighting here. So with the image in front of me, what I'm doing is I'm closing one eye and I'm holding up my pencil so that it aligns with the edge and I can observe what that angle is. And I'm looking at this angle in over here. And just to do a kind of a quick check in to make sure that I'm not too far off base. Uh, there's the, the other things that other tools that you have available for controlling the proportions are uh, comparative measuring uh, as well as plumb lines. So these are all things that over time, if you're a new artist, you'll get more comfortable with as you go. And when I was talking earlier about kind of ch doing check-ins to see where you're at, you're at, making sure you're in the right spot. Um, that comes out of the use of plumb lines. So what a plumb line is, is a vertical line down from a landmark. So say if I look at this, uh, this pedal over here and there's a high point, that can become a landmark and I can draw a line down here. I can visualize a straight line, a plumb line, and I could see where that line would cut through the, the rest of the drawing uh, and make sure that that's, that feels correct. So now what I'm doing is I'm looking at this area and it doesn't feel like it's going to quite fit together the way I need it to. So I need to look at some of the proportions so I can do some comparative measuring. So let me see, what I'll do is I'll take the height of this pedal over here, this chunk over here. I'm going to compare that to the width. And so if I take this height here, it should equal the distance between this high point here and this high point over here. Look at the angle. Okay. Taking these taking these measurements. And it's pretty close. So I feel like the, the major shape is, is pretty solid. I'm looking at these high points here. Um, and now I need to look at then that space between that. If I know that those two points are good and they're they're pretty fixed. Let me grab my eraser, and I need that. Um, if I know that those two points are fixed, I can kind of then break down the spot between them. Then there's this bump here that should be halfway between. That feels pretty good. And then there's this little bump here. Because what can happen um, with as, as I'm observing individual parts, the more focused I become on an individual part, the more it grows, it tends to get bigger. It's taking more of a, a place in the mind. And, and so we have a tendency to then exaggerate that on the drawing. We have a tendency to make that larger. 
Uh, so that's why, again, why it's important to be moving around the drawing as much as possible um, because staying fixed on a, on a specific area can be uh, uh, distorting to some degree. Uh, you know, the challenge that I like to present to my students is, you know, go look in the mirror and stare at your nose and, and invariably it will grow right there in front of you. So we're just going to work on, again, we're just, I'm just kind of locking in some of that negative space here. Okay, that feels pretty, I guess that's feeling pretty good. What I'm having, what I'm struggling with is this shape in here. Right in there. And making sure that that all lines up. I think what I need to do is make this a little bit bigger over here. Um, and then you want to decide for yourself how accurate you need to be in terms of those proportions. Um, for me, I, I like the challenge of trying to get those proportions right, so I'm going to do that for this one. But for other drawings, it may not. I may determine that it's not quite as, as important that I get those proportions quite right. But we'll stick with it a little bit. So um, the, the key to it, though, is that you, as you get more information on the page, you know, the, the, the more you have to work with. Uh, so, you know, it's, I, what I, I liken it to is putting together a jigsaw puzzle where, you know, for, for most people, you know, the strategy becomes where you, you reach into the box, you pull out a handful of pieces and you put them on the table. And then as you gather information about what's on each piece, those pieces move around until they lock together. It's a very rare person who can reach into, the, into a box, pull out a piece and know exactly where it goes on the table, never to be moved again. So... Um, that's what we're doing here with their drawing. We want to te treat our marks as fluid and flexible, just like puzzle pieces on the table. We move them around until they lock together. As we gather information about the subject, then the, the drawing itself will kind of come together, the object will come together. So I'm just going to, in here, kind of give myself some kind of mental notes. I'm trying to keep these marks really light, loose, Uh, let's see, I'm looking at some of these darker areas. So even within the object, the concept of positive and negative space plays out. So we have this petal down in here. There's this dark shape in here that becomes negative space. So even though it's you know, technically a positive space as well as part of the flower, there's a positive negative relationship between the, those two layers of petals. Um, and that's what I'm, I'm looking at here. I think what I'd like to do is, is kind of erase some of this out and just establish those basic value relationships. You can see I'm not being very precise with that at this point. I'm just kind of blocking in major areas of light and dark. Uh, now, oh, let's see, I'm gonna use my old shading stump. I'm gonna just kind of smudge in the background here with my shading stump and really what I'm doing here is loading the uh, the stump here with charcoal. I want it to pick up charcoal and I'm rotating it in my, my fingers so that it picks up fairly evenly around it because then this becomes a drawing tool for me. Now, you know, as I'm blending, I'm trying to be mindful of, again, the edges, the, the direction that the edges are making. I want these background marks to run in a different direction to help reinforce the spatial relationships. So I'm just kind of smudging things and I want these to move in a different direction because our eyes will perceive the direction of the marks and will make a determination for us about where those, that object is in space. And so uh, uh, if, if the marks in the background run parallel to the edges of the flower, there's a high likelihood that those marks will be interpreted by the mind as being part of the flower. And then it, uh, then it really starts to throw off our understanding of that form. I can do kind of a quick gestural sketch in here. So this is what I really love about the shading stump it, it, or the blending stump. It's not just about smoothing out your materials. It's an, again, an opportunity to contribute to your understanding of that form. 
You always want to be contributing to that form. There's always an opportunity, and that's how you get kind of efficiency in your marks. So I can start to think about the flow uh, and the grain of the flower a little bit. I'm blocking some of these uh, some of these values here. And I'll be working back and forth between uh, utilizing the uh, the charcoal here that and and the and an eraser and in this case you know I'm I'm drawing with the shading stump but it's all about applying it's an additive process applying uh, charcoal to the paper and what I like about this shading stump especially if I use it utilize it on its side and I'm gentle with it it um, is a great way to create lighter marks. That are that are more likely to disappear um, it, later on in the drawing again because I want to get rid of the outlines. If I want to go for realism, I want to get rid of the outlines here. And so as I'm laying in these dark areas again, I'm I'm trying to be aware of where I am in the in the context of the whole drawing. So I'm looking at um, looking at these other shapes as well. So as I'm making this mark, I'm doing a quick check and my eyes are moving very back and forth very quickly between the reference photo and the drawing. Um, and you know, I'm looking here and then I'm looking here and here and here and here, all these different landmarks just to, just to kind of make sure that I'm in the right spot. Because it's very easy to make an assumption that we are in the right spot when we're act, in fact quite off. That's happened so many times. That's what happens to me in portraiture and why I need to practice that so much. Um, because I get caught up in the individual features of the sitter, of the subject, and then I, I kind of lose sight of where I'm at in the context. So I might be drawing the eye, and I'm drawing the eye beautifully, but it's not in the right spot. And if it's not in the right spot, then it's never going to look right. Uh, so as I'm doing this, I'm also trying to be mindful of the, the flow of the, kind of the grain of the petals and allow the, the direction of my kind of the shading stump here to replicate that and suggest the texture. And in that way, you become really efficient. The more you can suggest texture, the better, um, because um, it's, it's one of those elements in nature that, again, our, our, um, our subconscious almost processes it more than anything. Uh, we don't really stop to really un to think about, well, what are the visual cues that indicate that this is a flower, a leaf, or gravel, or, you know, brick, things like that. You know, we just take that, all that information, our subconscious processes it, and tells us that is brick. So, um, but when you're drawing, you start to have to pay attention to, you know, what are those visual cues? How do I know what that is? And if we over-render something, then... Um, it can, it can be confusing for the eye to perceive. Uh, so uh, I've talked a bit about this in other episodes, but because lines are, um, are symbols for edges, um, and we as humans are, are primed to perceive lines and interpret them as edges, if a, if a drawing is overly detailed or it has too many lines in it, if we're outlining every little brick in a wall, for example, then our brain says, it looks at those lines and it says those must all be individual objects. Uh, and, and then it starts to fracture. Whereas if we suggest things, we utilize a, 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 you know, our other faculties in our brain to piece together that. You know, so our brain fills in the rest of that information. Um, and when it does that, then you can become really efficient in your mark making and realize that you don't have to draw every little thing for the mind to perceive it. And then sometimes drawing every little detail actually becomes more confusing for the eye, again, because it's, um, it's perceiving each one of those elements in a, in a textural field as being separate objects. All right, so back and forth between the racer and the charcoal. 
So I'm doing some negative drawing here, looking at the shape of the light and trying to um, establish those areas. Now there's not a whole lot of detail or refinement. Now I'm gonna, like, as they go through, I'll continue to refine the edges. Um, part of what I'm really doing though is I'm trying to observe the shape of the shadows. And if I look at the reference photo with blurred eyes, this is generally what I'm seeing and I want that to reflect that. Most of the drawing is completed with my eyes being out of focus. Um, and, and it may take some practice if you're new to drawing, but I think it's really helpful to practice seeing through blurred eyes. You know, that, so that can happen through squinting. Um, I also like to alternate between squinting and then opening my eyes really wide so I look like an insane person and, I, and I'm, I'm letting the light kind of flood in, right? And it, it often uh, it can be amusing to the people observing me draw because my eyes are all bugged out as, I, as I'm observing, but I think it's helpful because it helps me to eliminate detail and flood my eyes with light and then squint eliminating detail, but reducing the amount of light. And so I, I, I get to encounter the subject in a few different, um, in a few different ways. So as you can see, I haven't picked up the charcoal in quite some time. I'm able to get quite a bit of mileage out of this shading stump. Um, I'm gradually just kind of refining the forms Actually, this line in here needs to come in a little bit. Let's make this a little bit darker. And I'm trying not to bear down too much on the paper. If I do that, it'll become a really permanent mark. I'm not sure I want that. And I'm ro rotating, I'm rolling the shading stump in my fingers so that I have kind of freshly loaded charcoal available when I need it. Still trying to think about it in terms of shape. I want to be drawing shapes, not lines, as much as possible. And charcoal can get messy. Um, I know, you know, some of you may be kind of put off by the charcoal. Um, one of the reasons I'm using charcoal is that it's it just shows up better on camera, um, and so you can see things a bit more effectively. I've I've learned in the series when I use um, graphite, these early stages are often so light that I get kind of confused questions from people. They say, are, is it out of focus? Is it, uh, are we seeing it accurately? Um, and it's just because it doesn't quite pick up on the camera very well. All right, so I'm just kind of suggesting this. I'm looking at the grain. This is where I can really kind of suggest the form and what I'm doing is I'm utilizing the side of that shading stump. You can see how that tip's kind of pointed in, but there's these ridges in the shading stump that actually create an interesting texture. And I think that works out all right. There's some kind of a, a crumple in here that I can start to suggest as well. I don't really know what's happening in that, that area yet, but I don't want to get fixated on it yet. I'm going to come back around to it. Another thing, if you're, if you're new to drawing, one of the things that can be helpful is to, um, to learn how to create um, lines and shapes um, in a few different ways. So for example, here we have these vertical you know, vertically oriented shadows are more vertical and you've got these kind of curves to it. So one way to make them is to make lines that are vertical. Another way to make them is to envision that path and then create it as a sequence of marks that run in a different direction, kind of wiggle it down. Um, and the, and in general, if you did that second option, the use of the kind of the wiggling moving against the direction of the, the overall shape um, is uh, more effective at creating the suggestion of light and shadow. Um, and we're going to perceive it as a distinct shape. If we, if we have the lines run this way, it'll, it'll be interpreted as a line, which could then be interpreted as a second shape. Um, again, it, we read it as a contour, and, this, and it, we run the possibility that it could 
be confusing to the eye. Okay, so I'm building up values in here. Another kind of confusing area in here that I don't know is if I'm quite ready to tackle yet. So I want to start to look at some of the other information. I'm just kind of, again, building up charcoal on here. I'm going to look for some of the darkest parts. So right in here, there's a little dark spot. There's a shadow here. I'm not going to refine that edge, but if I can block in that shape, that'll be helpful. Uh, there's some kind of crumpled shadows in this area here. And then around here, there's a very sharp edge, and then the light becomes very strong. So I need to visualize what's happening here. So before I make that mark, I want to do a quick check-in to see, well, what else is around there? What other landmarks might be helpful to make sure that I get that in the right spot and generally the right size? And so there's other, there's another petal here that can be helpful. And you can see that I'm kind of putting in these landmarks and gradually just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Rather than moving from one detail to the next, I'm starting with major details, breaking that down into smaller details, and then into smaller, even smaller details. Uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm establishing different parameters as I go, uh, within which I'll place the even finer details. All right, so again, like here, I know it's a generally a light shape, but I'm not going to get bogged down by the detail of that specific shape. I can come back to it. You can see now the stump is really kind of pushed in. I can just pop that back out. And that's because this stump has been well used. That's why I have this new one, just in case. Build that up down there. Okay, so this is feeling better. I think I need to get a little bit of uh, value down in here and do some negative drawing. Uh, just to help to provide some context for those values. Our eyes are constantly calibrating to the values on the page and so we'll look at the darkest dark and we'll interpret that as black. And then sometimes you go back in and you add something that's even darker and then what was once black is now a dark gray. Um, the same with the lights. You know, once we've once we've covered the page, and there's then and it, there's no longer the white of the page. I think there might just be a few spots down here where there's bare white. If we get rid of that, then that'll help. But and then it will interpret that as white, even though it technically isn't. We'll take the whitest white and we'll we'll just assign it in our mind white. It's kind of like, you know, in, in home, house paint, right? You know, being in a room and you say, that's a white room. And maybe you take a sheet of paper, put it up against the wall, and you realize that it's not a white wall. It's actually somewhat gray. Um, we do that all the time. We're constantly calibrating. Okay, so I'm going to start to refine some of these edges here, laying in some of the values. As I'm doing that, I'm trying to be mindful of the, 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 the texture. So I'm trying to wrap around the cross contour and suggest the texture of that, the flower petal. Uh, so here, if we, if we lay down some of the charcoal and kind of wrap it up around, we can bring in the shading stump and start to, start to smudge that out a little bit. And so, and then as we do that, we can start to refine, uh, start to refine this edge here. And I want to be careful as I start to add the de say the detail in here. There's a very specific shape to that, and and it becomes a bit of a focal point. And so, what what I want to avoid doing is creating a solid line around that. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is kind of put together some landmarks. So just as I talked about earlier about starting with outer landmarks and then gradually getting smaller and smaller, we're doing that just in this one area here. So I'm going to kind of move around the shape and then gradually kind of piece it together. 
And so as we come through here, I just what, what I want to avoid though is that line. If I make a line, then I run the risk of it just kind of flattening out. And if I'm, if I'm going for realism, I got to get rid of that line, like I've been saying. So, so again, now positive and negative space playing in to this, to this in here. So now I'm working in that background, but my, my intention is to continue to refine that form. Um, so here we go. We're just going to kind of lock that down, use, a, use an eraser to cut back out that form. So again, moving back and forth between laying down the eraser, maybe the shading stump a bit, adding some charcoal, erasing, and then if we need to, You're going to add a line just a little bit here and there, and you're going to get used to it yourself. You're going to determine for yourself, how, you know, how much of a line is is too much, how much is not enough. Um, and sometimes you like you might like the expressive nature of a line, and maybe you want to have something in there, but you want to be you want that to be a conscious choice. Is is my philosophy. Um, when you're when you're adding a line, you know we sometimes we just kind of take it for granted because it's something we do so naturally as humans, right? We we start drawing things by out creating outlines and then filling them in, and um, but as you start to observe nature, you realize that they don't really exist. There's this little kind of seam down here in that petal that I'm going to add. With that, come back up here, start to refine that edge. Uh, so right in here, I can start, I can do the same thing as I'm working this area, thinking positive and negative space, kind of tackling that shape from all different directions. Um, and then and gradually coming to understand it, there's kind of a darker edge along this. This might be right for a line right in here. And I think we can let's see. Let's see. I'm gonna actually. I'm gonna grab my new shading stump. Start to move this around. Do some negative drawing. Just add kind of this bumpy edge there. And if I need to, I think I can use my rubber eraser to add a little bit of sharpness, just kind of these short vibrations. And so yeah, again, we're trying to create, create that form without really outlining the edges too much. Let's see, this is all getting a little muddy up in here. Erase that out, Got a nice highlight here. And then, yeah, just continue to refine. So now, like, if we've done the big work, if we've placed the big shapes, as we work on the small shapes, we can focus our attention on them a little bit more uh, because we don't have to worry about them being in the right spot. We know that generally we're, we're moving in the right direction. So uh, right in here, there's this really interesting overlapping of these, these forms. I can sharpen that edge, just drop a little bit of a line down there. Uh, there's a little bit of a curl of light coming in over here. There's a little bit of light over on this side. So what I love about the kneaded eraser is that you can pinch it and shape it however you want, and that can make some interesting marks. So I kind of missed the mark a little bit on that on this shape in here, but I think that's all right. Uh, here's what I'm doing. I need to perceive this. This is this is all one petal in here, going from shadow into light. So 
I'm going to kind of drop in that edge, just letting the pencils kind of skip across the page to um, suggest, you know, in a very thin line, create that, that edge. Uh, and then what I can do is use my shading stump to come right up to that edge and then pull in some of that, that charcoal a little bit. And then this is where the direction of the marks can help. So if I, if I pull, use my eraser to kind of pull in this direction, use the shading stump to make marks that move in this direction, then it's more likely to, to be interpreted as being part of the same object. If I change the direction from light to shadow in that same object, if I change the direction of my marks, then I run the risk of the brain interpreting that as being two separate objects, if that makes sense. So I'm going to bring this, uh, I'm going to bring this highlight down here. And just kind of transition it subtly here. Ah, and then I missed a missed a shadow right in there. They're missing a whole petal. So I can kind of create that. And we go from light to shadow into light here. And just kind of continue to, to smudge it. And again, I want to be thinking about the direction of my marks so that the the light side and the shadow side all feel like they're part of the same, same object. So let's see. There's a lot, a lot happening up in this area, but I want to be really careful if I overdefine it, especially with an outline, there's a chance that the whole thing could just kind of crumble on the page. We're not going to be able to really interpret what is happening there. And so I would need to be very careful with what's what's actually happening in these areas. And if I use my eraser, pull out the highlights. And again, this is because I have everything locked down in terms of the big forms. I know where all the big forms are as I focus on the little forms. I don't have to worry about them too much. I can really hone in on what the, the specific shape is. All right, so you can see I'm just kind of rapidly switching back and forth between the shading stump, the eraser, the pencil. Let's see. And then I just need to ask myself, how, how much do I really need to dial that in? Um, you could sit and watch this for hours, I suppose, but it, uh, you know we uh, we don't necessarily have you know all all day, and I think we can move this along more quickly. So I'm going to allow some of these areas to be kind of less correct on here. So here's what we have: we have this large shadow shape where two petals fall into that same shadow, and they're defined just by this very subtle kind of dark edge, there's really kind of wavy edge that's, that's um, kind of unique to this flower. And so as I'm observing the path, my eyes are moving back and forth between the reference photo and the drawing. And rather than make one long line, I'm trying to create it as a sequence of these short squiggles. And again, that's where my eye will interpret that as a shape rather than a line or a contour line specifically. Um, so, so much about this lesson is really ultimately about that, about the, the difference between a thin shape and the interpretation of a contour line or the edge of an object with a contour line. All right, so I'm just kind of, again, I'm just moving through the, the smaller shapes now. And you can see it gets darker right in here, and that helps to create some really nice depth in here. That value right in here is really important. And you can see the change in direction that it makes as it pulls in to the center of the flower and then out. And then let's see, we pick up another kind of dark spot right in here. 
uh, here. You know, one of the one of the ways to also help create a more lifelike line is to utilize the edge, the side of your pencil rather than the point, um, and then kind of allow that pencil to roll in your fingers as you make it. It kind of breaks it up a little bit. You know, we don't often when in, when we're observing in nature, we don't often actually see the entire edge of an object. We see little bits and pieces that, again, our eyes are always moving, and then we piece together all that information to understand that there's an edge there. But in, in a drawing, if you break the edge up a bit um, so that if you follow along an edge, if there's constant variation, that it can actually be more comforting to the eye because that more closely reflects what or how we actually observe a shape. Uh, because we again we we don't often see it as one edge we see it as a piece of little bits and pieces of it that we then um, put together in our minds so what I'm doing in here is I've observed that there's a highlight right in here um, and so the whole thing can't be bright white um, it can be light so I've just I'm just but I'm knocking down that value just a touch so then I can come back in with my eraser and pull out a brighter highlight right in here right on the top of that flower and that will help to that'll help to create that that depth and the form that we're looking for. So just utilizing that shading stump. I mean using using the eraser and then bringing in the shading stump. And then I can start to create this, these wrinkles in here. These wrinkles don't exactly match the reference photo. And I think that's okay. You know, I'm going to let myself go with that. Um, just going to, because I really want to capture the kind of the essence of the, of the flower more than anything. And so one of the ways you can manage that detail in your mind is as you gradually refine the form, you can um, ask yourself, what is happening in the shape in that spot on the form? So, for example, if I look at this spot, I can, um, in my drawing, I can look at it on the reference photo, I can see, well, there's lots of these thin lines in here that I can then replicate um, with my materials. As I move up this petal, then it starts to kind of crinkle up, and we have these more kind of triangular, sharper edges. The shapes change, and I can change the direction of my marks to reflect that. So even if they don't exactly match the reference photo, the, the, the types of marks that we're making more accurately reflect what is happening in the flower, if that makes sense. So that's the way that you can start to manage detail if you don't feel the need to get everything exactly this, the way it, sh it is displayed in the photograph, is look in that region of the object and ask yourself, what is happening to the shapes? What types of shapes am I seeing? And then try to re recreate those types of shapes. And then this comes down in here. So now we're doing some kind of some positive and negative drawing at the same time. I'm drawing these petals in here, but I'm confronting the edge of the, this petal in front. So I need to be visualizing that path. And then I can create these darker marks that, uh, that end at that path. Bring in that shading stump now. And again, we get these we get these kind of longer lines that are going to project upward. There's a shadow across here that's really interesting. And now what I want to do is I need to bring a little bit more life to this petal in here. Uh, I'm looking at that grain, so I want the I want the marks that I'm making with the eraser to to contribute to the form. And in this case, I can. It will help to establish the texture if I actually take some um, some time to, to move my the eraser and the, the grain of the, the petals there. So what I'm observing here where I'm getting a little tripped up is I didn't give myself quite enough space in here to create those petals the way they the way they really look. Um, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna live with that. You know, I think it still suggests the form of the peony sufficiently. So I'm not going to kick myself for that or take the time to correct it at this point because uh, I want to move this along for you all. Um, but just kind of shouting out some of the observations I'm making.
and ask yourself as you're following along, you know, how do you feel about those those things? If you observe them being off, you know, do you do you feel the need to correct them? Does it does it inhibit our understanding of the the object? Does it contribute? Is it better? Sometimes a, a mistake can actually be better than we intend it to. All right, so I'm going to come up here. I really love this, the way the light strikes on this. So I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, and now in order to capture that light, it's really all about getting the shape of the shadows right. And then there's, within here, I know that there's, there's a light spot, but then there's a highlight. So what I'm going to do is kind of refine that edge using the kneaded eraser. It doesn't quite pull up as much material as the rubber eraser. So it's not a bright white that I've got there, actually. I think I need a little bit more control. So I'm going to use this new shading stump. And I think actually there, I need to get some, do some negative drawing to sharpen up this edge here. And then if I really want to draw attention to it, this is where I can utilize a line. So I can bring into a line just for a little section of it. And that'll help to pop that without overwhelming the, the senses and uh, confusing the, the, its place and space. So now as we go, again, my eyes are moving back and forth very quickly between the drawing and the reference photo. And I'm visualizing the path along that, and then I'm trying to bring my marks up to that path. So rather than draw that, that kind of S-shaped line there, I'm creating it as an accumulation of marks that run in a different direction. Let's see, and then there's, here's another spot where I'm off. Like this little, this little petal that kind of curls up here is too small, not right, quite in the right spot, but I'm gonna live with it. I feel like this still suggests a peony, and I really love this curve. I can bring a line down there, do some negative drawing. Uh, right in here, I love how this, this petal here kind of curls over, so I'm going to drop a shadow right in here on top, and then it transitions into light then into that shadow again. And then we have some kind of translucency. If I squint my eyes, this is, this is darker here than over here. I just used a line to define that edge, so I need, but I, so I need to be careful about that. I need to see how that edge reads. All right, it gets darker in here. There's this wonderful, wonderful uh, leaf here. Transitions up into that light area. Let me drop this down. Blur that out and then I can actually suggest some of that light on that leaf. All right, now I'm going to come back into here, follow along that edge. I see a little, few little dark spots that I'll drop in. Okay, I'm going to bring this, get that form there. So there's really nothing, not a whole lot that I'm doing differently in any of these spots. It's all the same type of mindset. Again, thinking of the big forms gradually getting smaller, um, and I want to make sure that everything is unified by an understanding of the light, you know, the shapes of the lights and the shadows. And then here, and then also kind of pay, starting to pay attention to the edges. What are, where are some parts in the edges that stand out, like right in here, for example? Um, and, and what stands out to me may not stand out to you. And that's what's kind of awesome about observational drawing. I think the best way to learn is to draw from life. The next best thing I think would be a fo color photograph kind of like I have here, but it really you learn so much more when you draw from life. Um, and 
the what I love about that is that you know we we all may be looking at the same object, but different things about that object are going to stand out for you than it will for me. You know, it, there's so much information that our brains have to process um, that you know you you know you may for example may be drawn to the color well I may be drawn to the form and maybe there's a particular detail that catches one of our eyes but not the other um, you know because the way the brain processes information it takes all of that in and then it, it sends it into our consciousness that that um, then it has to figure out what to do with it you know and really ultimately what's important so part of what we're doing when we're drawing is trying to get to that raw data what is our eye really taking in before it sends it up to the to the the conscious mind because the conscious mind is really uh, it's going to be looking for whatever is most useful um, so for for some of us what's most useful about this may be the color or the texture or uh, you know something like that um, it, it, we don't need to stop and think well how do we know what we're actually looking at we don't we it's, it we take um, we do kind of take all of that information in we almost kind of take it for granted and we're like oh that's just it's a peony we know it's a peony because that's what a peony looks like but our brain has to make a you know a million calculations to understand that that's a peony and then it sends to our conscious mind that's a peony and then uh, you know you may have different emotional associations with it uh, maybe there's you know there's you know something particular in your own uh, history with a flower like this that um, is different than what I might associate with it and so then it's triggering memories for you but we don't ever have to stop and analyze the visual information that's coming into our eyes that tells us that this is a peony and instead we're engaging with the the result of that 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 the determination that it is a peony um, you know if it's a if you know, if we were out foraging for food, for example, then knowing whether or not this is edible would be uh, a valuable thing to know. Um, but for most of us, that's not a valuable, it's not valuable information. We don't need to know whether or not this is edible. We're not, probably not going to eat it. And I hopefully we're not going to eat it because I have no idea if it is or not. But um, hopefully you get the idea that, you know, what we're doing when we're drawing is we're stopping to actually take the time to ask ourselves, well, how do we know what we're actually looking at? Um, and we're taking a look at all the visual information, the shapes, the lines, the texture, the form, the color, and, and then we're really kind of understanding from it, it from that point, if that makes sense. A lot of times we actually overthink uh, about, you know, the subject, and, and, uh, and you know, so we're, and, you may then, once you have that knowledge about, well, we, now I know why I understand this to be a peony, um, you may make different decisions about how you represent that in your artwork. You know, if you look at somebody like Van Gogh, you know, he would look at a sunflower and, and he would make specific decisions in his artwork that are related to his interpretation of that and what that, what's important to him about that. You know, for some of you, it might be a, uh, the need to make it more of a photographic representation. For some of you, it may be more expressive. But I think for me, if you're drawing something representational, it all starts with that basic understanding and asking that question, how do I know what I'm looking at here? And then you start to ask yourself, well, well what am I really responding to here? And how can I express that in the artwork? Because it's not, and, and sometimes you're trying to express too much can be overwhelming. You kind of lose the overall message when trying to convey too much information. So then you start to, to kind of edit things out and say, well, what's most critical here? You know, could somebody make a painting where it's just the color? Um, could you know, you could do this in black and white like we're doing here, where we're really exploring the form. Um, you know, it can be symbolic, and maybe the peony represents something emotional. Maybe it becomes part of a portrait that um, has a different type of meaning, and maybe the peony says something about that person more than the person says about the peony. 
Um, but hey, like I said, it all starts from the idea that we take the time to stop and look and ask ourselves, how do we know what we're looking at? Kind of stop, almost stop our critical mind or thinking mind and just look and respond. Not like computers per se, you know, I mean, I think you, you don't want to lose your emotional attachment to something entirely, but more kind of the really embracing that form altogether and trying to um, kind of meditate on the subject a bit more. Really, I mean, that's the role of poetry in so many cases is, is using language to an ex express your deeper understanding, having contemplated a topic for a certain amount of time, I'm trying to find the right words to express that. I'll lay down some marks in here for this shadow. We're getting closer. To, I'm starting to feel more confident in this drawing. I just want to be careful of the direction of my marks. Now I, I really like drawings that have some sort of evidence of the thought process in there. Like I love seeing um, areas where the form is corrected. So maybe there's you know the, an expression or a demonstration of kind of older lines that are in there. You know, I, I would love that when students would post that and I would see the, the marks that they just couldn't erase. They were the incorrect proportions, but they, they, they couldn't erase them completely. And, and I would just love that because that's the, that's the part of, that we really kind of connect to on a human level. The, the idea that there's thinking happening and adjustments taking place that are at the hand of the artist. All right, so I'm feeling pretty confident, like I said, in this flower. Uh, I don't want to keep you here too much longer, so I just want to start to then kind of rough in that, um, you know, some of these, these leaves here and some of that background. So let me kind of talk through what I'm thinking through here. I'm trying to look for, again, for the shapes. I'm letting my eyes lose focus. Um, looking at the big shapes, trying to keep the direction of my marks changing, smudging them out, and just kind of going, just getting a little bit looser. And I, I, I love getting, you know, a little dirty with the charcoal. This is a great place to be more kind of expressive with the marks. Um, I don't know exactly what I'm expressing with these marks, but it feels good just to kind of loosen up after putting a little bit more detail into the peony itself. And so as we go through this, uh, what I want to do is start to suggest some of these forms here. So, you know, so there are these kind of negative spaces, these almost, almost tri triangular forms, and it can be most effective to try to create those uh, um, again, by using marks that run in a different direction. So rather than drawing that triangle explicitly, kind of create that. Um, you know, you saw me put some marks down and to kind of help orient myself, but I don't want those to be the dominant feature. So that way we can kind of end this drawing fairly quickly here, just kind of rough in some of these forms. And you can kind of see that our mind starts to piece that together. And, and hopefully, you know, if, if we had too much detail in the background, it could overwhelm the whole drawing. Hopefully with a loose background, it's enough to, to establish a context for the peony, um, but not so much that it distracts from it. Uh, if I use this eraser, now I can erase out some of the light. And there's this light there, there's some light through here. And then use drawing with the eraser is, is just as much about touch as, as drawing with the charcoal can be. You know, there's the pressure is really important to be aware of. Direction of marks. But I'm feeling actually pretty good about where it's at right now. I don't know as if I need a whole lot more. 
I'm just use, utilizing the, the eraser now more as a, it's a blending tool. And if I need a bit more to come off, I can just lean in on it a bit. Maybe I'll add something to define this a bit more. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. I think we are just about done. So I want to thank you for watching. Hopefully um, you've learned something from this lesson. Um, and you know, check out all our other resources at artistnetwork.com. You're going to see a link below to our page on Artist Network where um, you'll link further into each of the individual show pages. And, and so many of you have been sharing work um, with the community. So I get to see what your drawings actually look like. Um, lots of positive comments coming in through there uh, on everybody's work that's being submitted. So I want to thank you all for joining me. Thank you all for contributing um, and making Drawing Together really an awesome experience for me and hopefully all of you as well.